Erev Tov. Good Yantiv. I remember the day that I got married. Glad my wife just stepped back into the room before talking about this. We had the beautiful chupa, kiddushin, the beautiful ceremony. It was in Seattle where my wife Rachel was living. And that feeling of unbounded joy and also of overwhelm. And then that moment of breaking the glass. Right? The glass in our tradition is symbolic of a pause within all of the joy of that moment before we break it. Because although we are celebrating all of us together on that day, the union, there's some sobriety because there are beloved family members who are not with us. We're unable to make the trip. And the world itself is broken. We have the custom to sing, Im Eshkachech Yerushalayim, if I forget the O Jerusalem at that moment. And I remember having a moment before the breaking of the glass, a moment the people who were not able to join us that day, beloved family members no longer with us, or too infirm, or were disconnected from us, and also everyone looking at us, but us also looking at them and seeing where they are in their lives, some with good periods, some with challenging periods, the fragility of all of our lives. And even that thought of then, before the Mazel Tov, taking that leap into a life of responsibility and of shared love with many more human beings, and joys and sorrows, all of them unknown. But then the outbreak of pure joy. And then the picture is after the glass was broken and we sang Mazel Tov, we ran and danced down the aisle and it looks like Rachel and I are literally, our feet are above the ground. And for us as Jews, getting married has a deeper connotation. A wedding is the creation of a new home in Israel. A home in its own unique way, big or small, however, becoming part of something larger a story, the repair of the universe. And the Midrash asks, well, what was God doing before God created the world? Where well, he was arranging shiduchim. He was making matches. And it's not saying that God is a conscientious matchmaker, planning that far in advance, but rather that a match, a marriage, a home, is part of the very divine plan for creation. And when we're creating a new home, we're bringing healing and joy. But perhaps above all, we are bringing meaning into our own lives, into the lives of others. And this is our response to the broken glass of this broken world. And this is also the space of Yom Kippur. On a very individual level, on a communal level, we take a moment in our lives and stare at the fragility of all of it broken glass. We acknowledge this is on some level the very nature of our world, our relationships, the people we share life with, our own self. But then we declare it does not have to remain this way. I can do something about the brokenness in my life. I can fill it with meaning and purpose. And there is so much in our lives and in our world to ponder at the moment. The pandemic, Ukraine, and our renewed threat of nuclear war, which seems every day a little bit more worrying. At the very least, a threat of a new Cold War, well, not so cold at the moment, of ideologies <clears throat> battling democracy, totalitarianism, and the horrors are being committed right now before our eyes, before the eyes of the world. Then there are all of the economic worries, so this year, the words of the Unetani took a prayer, speak loud and clear, like a broken shard of a pot, as the grass that withers. And as we pray later in our Kol Nidre service, as the clay being molded, we don't have control over anything. Everything is fragile. Everything is challenging. And yet, it also reminds us that we are part of something greater than ourselves. 
and you are the everlasting God. And it leads us to think deeply about how we bring this precious gift of a meaningful life into our days and into our years in all of its different forms. You look and you can see how it can all be taken away from us, disappear in the blink of an eyelash. What then is the purpose of all of it? And how do we find that meaning? So this is what we do on Yom Kippur. We spend our time thinking about how do you bring meaning into our life? And how do we birth something truly meaningful and beautiful into our lives and into the world, faced with the fragility of it? And for some, it's an act of creation that reveals all their labors over the years, writing a book or more than one book. Because once they write one book, they want to bring another one because it captures a part of their heart and their mind and their soul. And then eventually they come to a point where they want to burn all of the books they've ever written because they're no longer the same person who wrote them. And others pour their energies into business, a career, helping our economy, this one small part of sustaining the millions of people in this greater city, our nation, delivering health or food to feed people, entertainment, or just one small moment in a day to make people's lives a little bit easier. Devoting hours to research to alleviate a disease affecting millions and what they're undergoing. Creating a new piece of music that thrills and inspires that's never been seen in the world before. Heard by just a family or by thousands or by hundreds of thousands. Or pieces of art where we show a glimpse of our soul to our people we love, to the greater community, and of our wrestling with the creative forces of the universe and of the great universal consciousness. And just the meaning of being really good at what we do. And for us Jews for millennia, how did we find this joy, this meaning of creativity? It was in bringing a chiddush, a new thought in Torah or interpretation in Talmud. And so why did Jews delve into our text for so many thousands of years to find that new idea, pitting all those different ideas from these commentators, one against the other, disseminating, reconstituting, bringing them together, but just to find that one original idea. And then if it's accepted by others, to become part of the canon and even to have our name on the same page as the greats of our people, Rashi, Maimonides, Ibn Ezra. And I remember once walking with my father in the uh, Pico Robertson neighborhood in Los Angeles, the Jewish area of Los Angeles, the Chud, as they call it. And on Shabbat afternoon, we met someone we knew from a local minion that we attended a man who had won Emmys for writing for The Simpsons, and he looked like one of The Simpsons. But that day on his face was pure glee. He didn't even say hello. He just came forward to us and turned to us, and he shared some Torah. And it was something very obscure about the numerology, the gematria of this idea and that thought, and so-and-so's commentary and how it linked to our Parsha. He just had that feeling he was carrying a precious treasure and he'd brought it, a new idea into the world. There's also the meaning that we find from helping people directly, those who are in need, whether through our jobs or as a volunteer, people who are suffering because of health, mental health, all the lonely people, those who have nothing. When I was a teenager, my uh, family spent six months living in Calcutta, India. It was one of the most important experiences of my life. My father was doing volunteer work. He, he took time away from being a rabbi to do that. And he was working as a paramedic, helping the poorest villagers who had nothing, hundreds of them every day, giving them a shot of vitamin A. That's how simple it was to restore their eyesight. Some of them lost uh, that almost completely for a long time. And I remember him saying then, or maybe it was later, 
But those moments he thought, forget all this rabbiing. This is where I feel I can really help another human being. And I remember even as a teenager seeing his face every day when he came back from work. He had light and purpose and so full of life. And then there is a meaning of connecting to something greater than us, than just the daily rhythm of our lives. For us, the Jewish people, in many ways, it's our long story, our, who we come from, loving our story, loving the story of the Jewish people, from Abraham to Moses to King David to the rabbis to the old country and the shtetls and to our families and those who brought the old country into the new country. And what is the Torah all about? It's about having in this world a document that symbolizes something greater than ourselves, that is above everything else. And once we have that document of ultimate meaning, we find the tools to take that ultimate meaning and have it turn into personal meaning for us in our lives. So the rabbis understood there are many ways of doing that with the Torah, of finding personal meaning and the ultimate meaning. There's a simple level, the pshat way of interpreting, just the literal stories that we're reading about and what they teach us, ex extracting, clarifying, what do they mean? What was the lesson? If Abraham argued with God, that means that we too should argue with God when we, when we see injustice. Or remez, the hints in the Torah, to lead us to think about the themes of our lives. Why was Jacob, who deceived his brother, then deceiving, then deceived himself by his uncle Laban to marry Leah instead of Rachel? What does it teach us about all how we end up reaping what we sow, all the life lessons? And Drash, like Midrash, just going deeper into our Torah, between the lines, and to imagine the story that the Torah does not tell, and that we wonder about. What was Abraham thinking when he was walking to go sacrifice his son? Using our imagination and our intuition to build and bridge our lives to this ancient text and open up endlessly new thoughts and teachings. And finally, there's a sod way of interpreting the Torah, the secret way, uh, as it's called, where we look into the deep secret teachings of the Torah to speak about even greater perspectives, the nature of what it means to be a human being, the nature of the universe, how we walk in the world. As it says, Isaac's eyes are dimmed, and the sort of interpretation is, well, why, why is the Torah mentioned this? Not because you could not see, but because he was seeing uh, on a whole other level, seeing spirits, eyes of wisdom, which is what we are trying to aim through as we go through our years in this world. And that's why I believe that studying Torah upholds the entire world. We derive meaning and create meaning. And this is one way that we Jews are able to protect ourselves from some of the fragility of the world. One of the way we push aside the brokenness and we try and create a place of purpose and meaning repairing the cracks in our world. And that particular Jewish method of finding meaning is alive for every generation because its ways are infinite and we each can strive to dis discover how we can bring it into our life. So I think about this every time we have a bar or bat mitzvah that gives a speech from this bima. But they're part of that process of finding that meaning, bringing meaning into the world, that repairs the world. And they bring new Torah because they're looking at our ancient text and weaving it with their unique life experiences of being here in our time. Every generation. That's why when we have an aliyah, we say, Noten ha Torah, who gives the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, who gives the Torah. Not who gave the Torah in the past, but who gives it. And the question is, are we there to receive it? Do we seek and find that meaning? And maybe we have that at 13 years old, because 13 is around the age when we begin to really see the world as it is. We begin to see the fragility, the complexity, when we see that our parents are human. And we start to see and become aware of all the different shades of human behavior and of our own behavior, and our quest for meaning begins. So there is a tradition that 
on Yom Kippur when Moses was when Moses descended with the second set of the Luchot, of the Ten Commandments, right? The first set was carved, we teach, with God's own finger. And they were perfect, exactly what the Jewish people needed. But Moses, in his anger, when he saw the people worshiping the golden calf, he smashed them in his anger, and they were lost. And in the aftermath of that failure, Moses ended up climbing back up the mountain to plead for the people. And eventually God assented, and he gave them a second set, the second Luchot, the second Ten Commandments. But these were only partly written with God's hand. Not every word, not every part. But that meant that the rest was to be written by Moses and be written by us. They were not perfect, but yet they were ours. No longer just a divine gift. But they included everything that we put into them, our prayers, the people's repentance, the work to bring the Torah into reality and to live by it, to think about it, and to take it further and further. And not to keep the meaning just for ourselves, because the purpose of Yom Kippur isn't just to take the meaning and think how our own lives can be more meaningful, but then to share it with other people. And this goes back to our very founding story of Mount Sinai, when God came down and said, do you want to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests to teach others how to live a life of meaning? And we said yes. And then we received the instructions first so that we could do it ourselves before we brought it into the world. We can say that we did it. As Maimonides says in one of his commentaries, Christians and Muslims in their way are directly living their own expression of the Ten Commandments and what happened on that day. The life of meaning that was given to us, now half the world on some level is living it. We continue to fulfill that role in all the ways we contribute to the world, in humanity, in arts, in science, literature, politics, philosophy, absorbed in our quest for meaning and how we can transmit it. Years ago I was in Jerusalem and I went to see a play uh, about the life of Baruch Spinoza, the, 17th century uh, Dutch philosopher who was excommunicated uh, by the Jews of Amsterdam. We do not actually know truly why he was excommunicated, but we know he'd been a genius of Torah in his youth. What we think is that he came to a different, we know from his writings, how different his understanding was about the nature of the world, the nature of God, of scripture, and that must have been too threatening for the Jews of his time. But that didn't stop him from pursuing his quest for meaning. And the play was imagining it, all the threats of excommunication, meaning he couldn't see his community, his family, all the people he knew. Because for him, that quest for meaning was really about a quest for truth. And in his mind, he was just doing what Jews had always done. Because he understood that behind the Torah, behind our Jewish search for meaning was ultimately a Jewish search for truth. And that when we're seeking meaning, on some level we're really seeking truth. And Yom Kippur is a day of truth. Our search for what is meaningful eventually leads us to what is true. The truth of being a mortal being, as we think about on this day, the truth of who we are and who we are not, and where we are and where we are not in our lives. There's a phrase in our blessing that's in the uh, Musa for all of our holidays that we all love to sing, Melech HaKol Aretz Mekadesh Yisrael. The sovereign of the whole world sanctifies Israel. But before that phrase, we recite the words, Dvarecha Emet Kayam La'ad. Your words are true and stand forever. And this, this, these words are the same in every mahzor, whether it's for Ashkenazim or Sephardim or the Sephard uh, mahzor, which is a Hasidic mahzor. We say your words are true, eternal, and unchanging. And so our tradition teaches that during these days of awe, what we try and do is reach up into the heavens, into ourselves, and touch a little bit on that eternal divine truth and that eternal divine word, 
and bring back a piece of that truth for our own lives for the year ahead. The personal truth and wisdom that we really need to go forward in our lives, all the different parts. So what is the eternal world, the eternal truth? The Midrash teaches that we each have one letter in the Torah. Every person has one letter that they have to reveal in the Torah. Not only in these Torahs are made of animal hides, but in the Torah that we teach is the very DNA of the universe, the supernal Torah, the Torah which is the wisdom of everything. We have to find our letter in that Torah, and that is our path to meaning. And we each have a portion of that eternal truth that we can find, and that is our own, and it speaks to us. And finding that truth and meaning is why we are here on this day and also so that we can uphold the values and ideals that help us to remember that. And that's the purpose of all the rituals, of the fastings, the blessing, the prayers that we recite all year long, but especially on this day. We discover what is our path in life. For some meaning is found just in having a family and living a caring life and giving all their love and energies to their family members. And taking that pause to always break that glass into the chupa to see how beautiful and fragile and precious life is and to resolve to make our home a place that can help repair and contribute to the world in our own unique way. For others, meaning is found in their work. In our synagogue's life, we're also trying to bring meaning and power to what we're doing. It's one of the reasons that Cantor and I have been bringing music into our service trying to bring it alive in ways to make even more people uh, find meaning in it. We've accomplished a lot over the last few years and we still have much to be done. The world is fragile, our, live, our lives are fragile, like that broken shard. But let us remember to keep stepping on the glass and never forget that brokenness, but also to remember to run down the aisle taking in all the extraordinary beauty that is there and the wonder of our world every day of our lives. And doing all we can to fill our days and our minds and our hearts with that meaning. Whatever it is that brings meaning into our lives, from music to art, to religion, to Torah, to seeking out truth, the truth of who we are and what this world is about and who is our God and what the divine means for us. So we have a whole day to contemplate to connect to the eternal world, like the Kohen Gadol, the high priest who on this day would enter into the Holy of Holies to find the love that animates all life, to help others, to help ourselves, to connect to the great creative process that renews our world every day. If we approach life in this fashion, then our lives are filled with joy and meaning, whatever happens outside. And then we'll be able to say, we have been here who we were meant to be, and we have lived this life as we were meant to live. We have done our small part in healing and uplifting this beautiful world. Good yantav.